and I'm, I will do that as well. So, um, should be recording now. All right, so I'm gonna talk to you today about um, something that uh, is a bit of a difficult topic to discuss, and I'm hoping to illuminate it. Um, and it's something that I think complements the words of our new president, Dr. Pena, uh, as well as Jerima, in that it's about challenges that we face at Purchase that we are not alone in facing, that are part of larger and broader serious challenges that, that higher education and society are grappling with, uh, but that we also have to confront head on ourselves at Purchase, and that I think there's a hopeful message here at the end. So I hope you do stick with me because I do think we're in a unique position and uh, we're at a good time with a lot of positive momentum and hope. And I am optimistic that we can start to address these challenges, even though, as I will um, hopefully make clear, these are really complicated and difficult problems. So I wanna talk about achievement gaps uh, at our college. And achievement gap is just a buzzword. You probably know what it means, but just to define it, it's any significant and persistent disparity in academic performance or educational attainment between different groups of students. For example, along uh, racial or ethnic lines between white students and minority students, or between students from higher income and lower income households, we will talk about multiple achievement gaps today. And uh, achievement gaps have been studied by uh, many people, psychologists, education researchers, policymakers, um, for decades. They exist at all levels of our education system in the United States, from K through higher ed, uh, through the, you know, the boardroom at uh, companies, if you want to consider those to be achievement gaps as well. So these are serious and persistent problems. And I think it's something that we at Purchase need to pay careful attention to and not just say, well, there's achievement gaps everywhere. So, you know, what should we care about it? Well, I think there's a few important reasons. Uh, the first is that any achievement gap between groups on our campus undermines our institutional and academic missions. This is something that Millie raised in her, her um, opening remarks today, that we have certain academic missions, for example, to serve all students equally, to give all of our students equal opportunities for academic success, and that is one of our core missions, and achievement gaps undermine that, op that, that possibility by raising this idea that not all students have equal opportunities for success. Um, similarly, um, uh, building on what Jerima said, these issues of achievement gaps between groups intersect directly with our core values related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. To the extent that we have uh, achievement gaps on campus, we are, again, undermining these values that we care about. And finally, I'll be a bit of a pragmatist here, although this is something that both Jerima and Millie raised, addressing achievement gaps is one way to address other top priorities. And this includes things like retention, which relates again to our institutional and academic missions and our DEI values, but it also relates to our, our uh, stability as an institution, our financial stability. So addressing issues related to things like retention, graduation rates, alumni giving, um, all of these uh, uh, goals that we have, uh, I think addressing achievement gaps speak right to those issues. All right, so these were the research questions that I developed uh, in concert with Barry, who, who really helped build, you know, make this project a reality, as well as with uh, Linda Bastone. Um, do we have any achievement gaps at Purchase? Um, so we've seen these measured in other institutions, but that doesn't mean we have them here. Um, if so, which groups are affected? And we'll also ask, what are the magnitude of these gaps? What are the causes of the gaps? And what can we do to close the gaps? So my research project this year focused largely on these first two questions. That's going to be the first half of the talk. And then over the past six months or so, I've been really diving deep into the literature uh, in, in psychology and education and sociology to some extent on the kind of causes and solutions. Although, uh, you know, to preview what I'm going to say, um, yes, we have achievement gaps. The causes are multiple and very complicated, and we actually cannot fully isolate what they are at purchase, although there's some hints in the data. And there are lots of things we can start to do to close the gaps, but it's going to be an all hands on deck effort. And it's going to take some uh, long term thinking and uh, coordinated planning to try to to try to um, assess and close these gaps. All right, so here's what I want to talk about today. Um, first, I want to present you with what I actually did. So I'll talk about the data that I had access to. 
um, and how I analyzed it. And I am going to get a bit into the weeds because I think it's important to understand exactly what I did and how I measured these gaps. It's not the only way to look at this, but it, but it is illuminating. I'm going to talk about the results of these analyses and some of the limitations associated with the approach that I took. Um, some possible causes and possible solutions, as I mentioned, so kind of some key takeaways and next steps. And then I'm hoping at the end, you know, we do have 90 minutes slotted here for uh, some questions and discussion. And I think that will also, as you'll see, lead nicely into the next section for today that, that we're going to have. Okay. So I'm gonna dive right in. I'm gonna to try to speak slowly and explain this stuff. Um, I know that some people aren't as familiar with some of these you know, research and statistical terms that I might be using. So again, I have the chat queued up. If you have questions, just throw them into the chat uh, and I will uh, do my best to answer them on the fly or else write down a question and I'll answer it at the end. So uh, I wanna thank uh, Barb Moore for helping me collect the data, but I was able to access three years worth of uh, student grades at purchase. So it was all grades for all students for all courses between 2016 and 2019. And this included information, so each row in my data set included information about what the course was, the level, the area, what type of course, lots of information about the course. I'll, I'll explain how I use that in a minute. And it also included student demographic data um, that, uh, that I will talk about. So we had tons and tons of data. Now, the data included some things that I couldn't use in my analysis and some things that needed to be organized. So I had to code the data and process it a little bit. And I just want to explain briefly how I did that because I think it's informative. So first of all, I had all the student grades, but they were in letter grades. And I just used this table right here to convert them to numeric grades um, so that the statistical analyses that I could do uh, it would be feasible. Um, I also removed any classes that were for graduate students or that were not classroom uh, courses. All right, so this is key. I eliminated any graduate things like graduate studios. I eliminated physical education classes, internships, mentoring tutorials, learning assistant, senior and junior projects, independent studies, uh, all these kinds of courses. There are a few more as well. Um, now, it would be interesting to look at these but I was really focused on sort of general classroom level achievement and for reasons that I hope will become clear later. Um, I also created a new demographic variable uh, to code the ethnicity or race of the students and that was underrepresented minority. And so this is, uh, this is how I classified it. If a student indicated they were Black or African American, Hispanic or Latinx, Pacific Islander, Native American, Alaskan, or chose two or more ethnic categories, they were categorized as an underrepresented minority and anyone else uh, was uh, not uh, an underrepresented minority. I did not invent this coding scheme. This is what I've seen others use in these kinds of analyses. Um, now, uh, Judy is asking about the demographic data. Does it include high school information? The answer is some high school information, but this is uh, something we, we, I will come back to. Where did the students come from before they got to us? Um, there are reasons why this matters and reasons why I think it, it doesn't matter. Uh, but we do have some of the high school information and some of it is key to the analysis and I'll mention that in a minute. I also recoded the course area and student major. I did this a couple ways, but I did it to simplify some of the analyses. So one broad categorization was just into school of liberal arts and sciences, the arts and then other. And I included, remember, I'm looking at class level data. So this was any liberal studies courses, communications courses or first year seminars. Those are included as other. I also further broke down LAS into its constituent schools because we do see different grading distributions in the different schools, as you will see, I will show you this data. And LAS is the largest school, the largest enrollment, so breaking it down um, does make some sense. I also uh, created an ordinal variable uh, uh, on enrollment size. So we have how many people were in the class, but I broke it down into four categories. You, this seems arbitrary. I tried lots of different coding schemes. They all yield the same results. This one yielded uh, rough, the, the most equal distribution of size. Basically, I played around with it, but the playing around with it didn't matter. Um, uh, Lee is asking, did I code the student's economic background? We have a demographic variable. Are they low income or not? So that is the one I used. And we also have whether they are first generation college. So are they a student who uh, whose parents did not graduate from a four-year institution or not, and I have that coded as well. 
So I coded en enrollment sizes into tiny classes, five or less, small, six to 15, medium, 16 to 40, and large, more than 40. Again, this was kind of my intuition, but it didn't really matter how we broke this down in the end. And um, here's one piece of high school data I did have from most, but not all students, which is what was their high school GPA. Uh, different schools code their GPA differently. Some it's out of four, some it's out of 10, some it's out of 100. I created a standardized variable so that for all students, it was out of 100 so I could equate across. There are problems with this because you know a 3.9 out of four GPA is not necessarily the same thing as whatever it is out of 100. So take this variable with a grain of salt. This is why I'm talking about the, the coding process. Um, and Rachel's asking about transfer students. I did not look at that and I'll come back to that. And that is something we could look at, but, I, I, but there are reasons why I didn't. So I'll come back to that. Here is some of the data. I know there's a lot of numbers, but I'll walk you through it. In the end, the total sample size across the three years worth of data was 6,920 students and 98,402 total grades. So on average, about 14 grades per student, although that varied widely. Some had one class and some had 20 something classes. The sample was about 57% female. And here I wanna flag another uh, slight limitation. Our gender data was coded in a binary way. I only got male or female. We do have non-binary students. We do have students that transition. And uh, this could be a limitation if you are thinking about what are possible gender disparities in grades. So just flag that. Um, we have about 41% underrepresented minorities, about 27% low income students, and about 18% per generation. And I should note, this is a fair, fairly diverse uh, student body, which I was happy to see. We are a diverse student body. And Jarima mentioned, you know, we're on the cusp of being able to qualify for certain uh, benefits related to being a Hispanic serving institution, and, and that's great. Um, in terms of the number of majors, uh, the most were in LAS, then the next arts, and then other, but there's a lot in each area. At the course level, uh, two thirds of the grades, or, or about 56% of the grades, are uh, lower levels, the rest are upper levels, although I'm not going to show grading breakdowns based on those two. That's another thing we can look at. Um, about a third are gen eds, and you can see the grades broken down by course area at the bottom, roughly following the amount of, of majors. Um, income, how it was defined, I have no idea. Uh, Don, that's a great question. That is the demographic data that the school had that I was able to access. So again, we, we, one of the reasons I'm showing all this is we can quibble about how some of these things are defined. Um, okay, so there are some irregularities in this data, some of which I've flagged could be a problem already, although I wanna point out they're all minor. These are all small, on the margin uh, troubles with the data that if you, they do not account for our, the, the results I'm gonna show you. So one is if you add the total number of males and females, you get three more than the total sample size. My guess is this is the result of students who are transitioning while they're in uh, college. And so you're gonna get a, a difference there. And so you end up with, with uh, more than the total number of students. Again, it's only a few. Um, similarly, the total number of majors is more than the total number of students. Again, this is probably due to students changing their major. And so you get, you're, you're measuring their grades in three different years and you see they've changed major. Again, it's only a small number, doesn't affect the results. But we do see similar discrepancies with some of the key variables, like are you an underrepresented minority not, or uh, this variable that Don brought up, which is your income level. So this could be errors in the raw data files. It could be shifting students' identities if they have to fill this out multiple times. Um, maybe at one time a student identifies with two ethnicities, but another time just one. I don't know. Uh, the good news is if you just take out all the students who uh, you know, are, are causing these discrepancies, it does not change the results. These are small uh, edges of irregularity on the margin. So it doesn't actually affect the, the results that I'm going to show, but worth noting, uh, this data set is not perfect. So let me describe my analysis approach. There are many different ways for those of you, uh, well, whether you do statistical analyses or not, you should know there, there's lots of different ways you could analyze this data. What I tried to do was take the most conservative approach, meaning what can I do to analyze these data in a way that, that sort of doesn't hype up the results? Because if we see discrepancies, even when I'm trying to do my best conservative analysis, 
it means that these effects that I'm finding are much, much more likely to reflect real underlying differences. So I tried to do that and tried to use um, a, a, a statistical modeling approach that, that would allow me to do that in a very simple way. Because one of the things you want to do is have basically not run a billion different statistical tests because that inflates your chances of finding false positive differences. So this is the approach I took. It's called linear mixed effects modeling. It's based on uh, a regression kind of analysis for those of you who did that. And it has the following properties that I'm gonna just try to explain that, that made it very useful. So one thing is like other regression approaches, it lets you test whether a variable, like whether a student is an underrepresented minority or not, significantly predicts an outcome. In this case, I'm doing that numeric grades. So I'm analyzing um, the course level grades. I'm not looking at GPA because that changes all, you know, for a single student every time they take a class or every semester. I'm looking at just individual course grades and I can see whether any given variable predicts those outcomes, is associated with higher or lower uh, scores in, in grade level uh, data. I can also look for interactions between variables. So you might say, look, underrepresented minority, that's not fully distinct from uh, you know, whether you're first generation or not. Maybe underrepresented minorities are more likely to be first generation and maybe it's the interaction of those two. It's the combination that really matters. Or you might say, uh, one thing I'll, I'll show you is maybe you know, uh, being uh, male or female, your gender doesn't matter for your grades unless the class is really large it interacts with class size. So this approach allowed me to test for these interactions. Somewhat uh, more importantly, because I can include multiple um, variables in a one single analysis, it lets me control for any relationship between variables. So I already mentioned, for example, there is a relationship between being an underrepresented minority and being a first generation student. You're more likely to be first gen if you're an underrepresented minority student. So I want to be able to control for that relationship in a single analysis so that I can tell you, for example, irrespective of whether you're first gen or not, being an underrepresented minority has this effect on your grades. So I can control for, for those effects and see if there's an independent effect of each of the variables of interest. And this is critical. Uh, and finally, and this is the most technical bit of this kind of modeling, you can specify what are called fixed versus random effects in the model. I'm not gonna go into detail on this. In the report that I've created, I talk more about this and that will be distributed to everyone. But basically what this allows me to do is account for the fact that students take multiple classes. And so if I know that you got a, a B in one class, that does tell me something about what you're likely to get in another class versus another student who got a C in a class or an A. So I can control for the fact or account for the fact that students naturally vary in general, irrespective of all this other stuff and inclusive of all this other stuff. And I can control for that and account for that natural variability. This also uh, accounts for the fact that I'm measuring a certain you know, uh, set of students at a certain amount of time and who is in that data set is itself kind of random. So it lets me tell the model that, that the fact that I'm using these students is itself kind of uh, a random chance that they were selected to be in this analysis. All right. That probably was too confusing, but hopefully some of this is clear. So let me talk you through the results. Um, in the initial model, in the initial analysis, what I did was I tried to predict your course level grades. I included uh, four variables of interest, four variables that other um, uh, researchers and scholars have consistently identified as where there are achievement gaps literally in K through grad school, and that is underrepresented minority status, first generation status, gender, um, and income status. So those are the, the variables that I included in the model. And I also let them fully interact with one another. So I let them all interact and see if that matters. And that also con helps control for some of the, the interesting possibilities of, of prediction. It turns out that, well, it, it, eventually I realized there are, no, there are no important interactions between these variables. All of the effects I'm going to show are independent effects of being in a certain uh, demographic um, category. So here are the, here's the, the major results. What I'm showing you in, um, uh, on the x-axis, on the horizontal axis, is, is a bar graph for each of the demographic variables of interest. Underrepresented minority in blue, no, in orange, yes. 
gender in blue, female in orange, male. Uh, first generation status, blue, no, uh, orange, yes. And low income status, blue, no, orange, yes. And what I'm looking at on the y-axis is the um, average course grades. The way I made this graph is that I took any given student, so I have their student ID number, I averaged all of their course grades, and, and then given their status as, let's say, you know, female, I averaged that average with all the other female grades. But no matter how you create the graph, you see something like this. Um, uh, I'm getting some interesting questions on the side that I'm gonna try to deal with, but maybe are, are good for the Q&A. So here's what I'm showing you here. Um, uh, Atar is asking if this controls for achievement gaps heading into college. The answer is no, but I will do that shortly. So what this is doing uh, is the following. I am showing you significant and large achievement gaps at purchase. Um, if you are a member of an underrepresented minority group, if you identify as underrepresented minority, on average, your average course grade is 11% lower than students who are not underrepresented minorities. That is about half a letter grade. That's the difference between a B minus and a C plus. That is a significant and meaningful real world difference. That is the difference between getting an internship, getting into grad school and not. Um, the second largest uh, gap on campus is the gap between female and male students. And I should point out that um, uh, our female students uh, greatly outperform our male students on average. And this I know is, seems surprising to some people, um, but in fact is, is what we see as national trends since the 1990s, again, K through grad school. Um, uh, the, the gender bias against women uh, is extremely important and meaningful, shows up on our campus in other ways, and shows up in society in even more powerful ways. And that is a little beyond the scope of this talk, but it's something we should talk about as well. The gaps for first gen and low income students are, um, are uh, smaller, but significant. Um, a couple of questions. One, am I tracking withdrawals, Ws? The answer is no. I removed those and I will come back to that. Um, the, uh, Jenny asked, this gap persists even if you control for this, the gender gap? Yes. All of these gaps are very highly statistically significant even when you control for being in any of these other groups. That gender gap is still significant highly. Um, the error bars, I got a message. These are 95% confidence intervals. Um, and I do not have information about employment from the students. That is something that we should talk about. Um, and again, the, the data here are coarse, and that is one of the limitations. So, all right, these gaps are big. They are independent of one another, even when controlling for every other variable. So if you are a female student, you know, controlling for whether you're underrepresented minority, first gen, and low income, and all of these interactions, you still have a very highly significant, meaningful achievement gap. And yes, uh, Kristen, I will, I will uh, distribute this PowerPoint and the uh, present, the, um, uh, report it's based on. I'm glad, by the way, all this engagement is great. This is really fun to <laughs> try to engage with the questions as I'm talking. Now, I think it was uh, Atar mentioned, did I control for achievement gaps coming in to uh, purchase? The answer is I can't. I don't know everything about the students and we cannot, we as a purchase community cannot control for what happened before, right? Students are coming in already with an, with an, uh, these gaps, but we can control what happens when we get to purchase. Now, there's one thing I can look at, which is I have access to students' SAT scores and their high school GPA. Now, we know your SAT score and your high school GPA are significant predictors of your college GPA, your college grades, right? So if you score really high on the SATs, you're more likely to do better in college. If you score really low, you're more likely to do worse. For all the flaws in those tests, they are highly predictive. They are valid predictors of college GPA. So I have that data. So one person, you know, one critique might be, well, I'm not surprised you have gaps in high school. Of course, you're gonna have gaps in college. Nothing we can do because probably the male students are just coming in with lower GPAs and lower SATs to begin with compared to the female students. So what I can do is I can add SATs and GPA as covariates in this analysis. What that does is first I can look at, do those predict grades at purchase? The answer is yes. But then I can control for the effect of those on these achievement gaps. Now I only had 
the both GPA and SATs for about 42% of the, the students. However, when you add those to the model, these uh, achievement gaps do not go away. They are reduced. There's two reasons for that. One, I'm only looking at a smaller sample now, only 42% of the sample rather than the whole sample of 6,900 students uh, and 98,000 grades. I'm only looking at 42%. So when you shrink the sample size, the, the uh, statistical significance of these effects is going to go down because you have re what's reduced what's called statistical power. Uh, but also because GPA and SATs are themselves predictors of grades, it's going to control for that when then looking at the significance or the magnitude of these gaps. However, all of these gaps are still statistically significant and in the case of uh, underrepresented minority status and gender in particular, wildly large, very huge effects even when controlling for GPA and SATs. So what that means is I've controlled for some measure of the gap in high school or how academically skilled or prepared a student was coming into purchase. And even then you see the gap. Another way of thinking about this is if I just looked at students who scored 14, 1500 on the SATs, you still see a gap based on gender and underrepresented minority status to a lesser extent, first gen and income, all right? So these are big meaningful gaps and they're not explained by high school GPA and high school um, uh, uh, SATs. Uh, Don is asked is how solid is use of GPA? Um, I don't know how, I don't know where the schools the student come from or their quality. All I can tell you is in this analysis, the GPA is itself a unique and significant predictor of college grades. It's not huge, but it is a predictor. So if you had a higher GPA in, in high school, you'd get a higher GPA in, in college. Again, there's problems with this. It's a noisy measure. It is not perfect, but it is in this data set. Um, now, another thing you might be thinking is, I bet my department, my school does not have achievement gaps. You are incorrect. So here, what I'm looking at, each of the four graphs represents one of the, um, one of the demographic variables of interest. And what I'm showing you is on the, the x-axis, the horizontal axis, is split up by school. And here what I've done, because within LAS, you have big differences across the different programs. I have arts and other, but I've split up uh, LAS into film, uh, humanities, social science, and natural science. And then again, on the x-axis, or on the y-axis, I'm showing the average course grades. And I'm using, again, 95% confidence intervals on these, on these data points. Here's what you see. If you look in the upper left graph, you see an achievement gap based on underrepresented minority status in every area of the school, in the arts, in film, in liberal studies and communications, in the humanities, in the social sciences, and in the natural sciences. And if you look across all of these, you'll notice that even though the average course grade differs uh, reliably across these, so art students are getting higher average grades than natural science students, um, this gap persists in every area. It's the magnitude is slightly varying, so the gap is slightly smaller in the arts than in the natural sciences, but it's still there and still significant. You can see for first-gen students, um, there's a couple areas, uh, social sciences and uh, liberal studies, where there doesn't appear to be much of a gap, which is interesting. Although, uh, what, I, what I would try to do if you're watching this is just take the big picture. We have gaps in every area. Every area of the school gaps for all of these variables, pretty much. The next thing I wanted to look at was the interaction with course enrollment size. And this, I think, is one of the is key, the most interesting findings. So here, what I have on the x-axis, the horizontal axis, is the, that course size categorization I did. So tiny is 1 to 5 students, small is 6 to 15, medium 16 to 14, and large is 40 plus. Now I'm averaging across all of the different schools. Um, and what you're looking at here is, is the following. In tiny classes, in classes where there's only one to five students, there is no achievement gap on campus in, for any of these variables whatsoever, nothing. Even once you start to get um, uh, to these small classes, you see these gaps, but they basically get bigger the larger the classes. So the larger your classes, the, the larger the achievement gaps are uh, for students in that class. Um, Samuel asked, why do the average grades vary across each metric? I'm not sure I understand the question. This is showing that basically in larger classes, people do worse in, on average, right? And that, and that, that discrepancy is 
uh, larger for, um, for smaller students. Chuck asks, I don't understand uh, why smaller classes do better. Good, because we're going to talk about that. I think that's one of the keys to addressing some of this. And are there similar uh, grade variants for tiny and large classes? The answer is no, because there's a lot fewer small classes. So the smaller classes, there's a lot fewer tiny classes. I will also say they're overrepresented in the arts, which is one reason why the achievement gaps are smaller in the arts programs. Um, so the, the variability is higher in the, in the tiny classes because we just have much fewer of those classes. I love all these data um, uh, uh, questions, by the way. Okay, uh, from the pre, wait, Samuel. All right, I'm gonna move on, but, but keep asking questions. I'm gonna try to get to them, it's hard because there's a lot coming in, but I appreciate the engagement here. Um, okay. So these are the main findings. There's, a, there's more to the analyses I did. I also did a bunch of other kinds of analyses that didn't make it into the final report because for various reasons, there's fishing expeditions, there's my skept being skeptical of digging too deep into any given variable uh, and thinking it might be a false positive. I am very confident in the results I'm presenting now. I'm presenting what I think are the key and most uh, important results in many ways. So let me summarize them. We have significant and independent achievement gaps for underrepresented male first gen and low income students on campus. They're not interactive. It's not like you have to be have three of these categories. No, in fact, being in any one of these categories is going to is going to predict you getting lower course grades. These gaps are bigger in larger classes, which is something I'm going to talk about. Um, these gaps exist in every area of the college, although there's some variability in magnitude. And these gaps are still significant when you control for high school GPA and SAT, which is like in a way controlling for academic skill or preparedness coming in. Um, so Laura's asking, were you able to analyze the intersection of these categories? Because there's no significant interaction between them in the, the larger models, we are not licensed really as a statistician, at least the way I, I was trained, to look at the interactions. They, if you find, if you look at the raw data and are looking for interactions, I, I would think that might be a, a false positive. I, I really, don't, um, really don't think there are meaningful interactions in the data. I thought there would be. Um, a couple other questions are soon. Uh, Keith is pointing out that, uh, hmm, it's interesting work. Oh, that's good. Yes, I, I'm hoping that we can get more involved with, with SUNY level things and, and thinking about closing the gaps. And Lee says combo multiple. No, so it's not that there's no additive property here, Lee. Um, it's, it's, really, um, uh, it's, really, it's, it's, it's really independent effects. And Yulia, for Yulia, the, the fixed effects are the um, demographic categories, are, are the fixed effects and, and the um, class sizes. Okay. There, I'm appreciating all these technical uh, uh, points. One thing I want to flag here, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news. My guess is no matter what I say today and no matter what we do this semester right now, it is possible that these gaps are going to be exacerbated this semester and maybe in the spring because of being online. In other words, if you are a low income student, any disparity and any of the problems that are affecting your course grades are likely to be exacerbated by being fully remote or mostly remote and obviously exacerbated by what's going on in our society and economy. If you're low income, it's much more likely that your family has been negatively impacted economically and health wise. Similarly, for being an underrepresented minority uh, individual right now in society. So that is something that is um, uh, that is something that is distressing to me. I'm hoping some of what I say in the second half of the talk will help. All I want to flag is really be mindful of all of that this semester. I'm going to say this like five more times, but please have uh, empathy uh, with your students and be compassionate. We don't know where they're coming from. You cannot identify where the students fall into these categories and it is going to be an issue and it's something that I know we all care about and I am extremely passionate about. So please, please, please be mindful of this stuff going forward. Um, a, couple, uh, a couple other questions. Can I add variables like work and extracurricular and subsequent studies? Yes, I'd love to. I wanna know much more about the students. I wanna learn much more about them because as you'll see when I get into the causes, this stuff is really complicated. Um, why are distinctions between the arts deemed less significant? They're not. 
the reason I split it up that way is that if you look at the differences in grades across the, across the conservatories, there are some differences you know, between you know, dance and theater, but they're not the same level of difference that you see between like film and natural sciences. So I felt it made more sense to split those up. And we have more students, a third more students in LAS. So breaking it up uh, doesn't, doesn't diminish our, our, our statistical power. But you don't have to break it up or you can break up everything into its individual majors and you see these same effects. Um, at Robin's pointing out we can use breakout rooms in Zoom. Perfect, she's presaging what some of the stuff I'm gonna talk about in, in a minute. All right. I'm gonna talk some limitations of this analysis. Um, oh, Paul mentions one limitation. Yes, a lot of these variables were categorically measured like income was low versus high. If we had a continuous measure, uh, if we knew you know, the income of each family on a continuous scale, that might have led to some interactions, absolutely. So there are some limitations in this data. One is the course measure of academic achievement. I am using letter grades in classes where they got a grade, in classes that were classroom setting. There are many other measures of achievement, Someone already mentioned, I didn't look at withdrawals. So uh, there's, a, you know, your grade in a class, in my view as a teacher, is not the same thing as your achievement in the class. So there's other ways to think about it. You know, if you were working two jobs and you were struggling, and so you end up with a C, that might not reflect your actual academic achievement, which is your paper was the best in the class by far. Your class participation when you were able to make it was by far the best. So this is a, this is a very coarse measure. It is not, it, don't essentialize it. And that's one of the problems with thinking about this stuff. It's not the same as your actual achievement. Similarly, a bunch of you have raised this. There are many other variables we could look at. You, what's, is it lower level or upper level? Gen ed, how many credits is the class? I collapsed everything together. A two credit class was worth the same as a five credit class. Are you a transfer student? Do you have a disability? I don't have some of this data. Um, uh, oh, Rachel asked, did you notice the change in spring 2019? I haven't looked at the, I, I was doing this analysis in January. So I only had up, uh, up, through, um, uh, up through fall 2019, and I haven't looked at spring 2020 data. Trust me, I will be doing this. As you'll see, one of the things I'm hoping to do is make tracking of this stuff over time part of what, what I do and track part of what we do as a community. So I didn't look at also the, the people on the margins. So I bet you have bigger gaps if you take into account who is withdrawing from the class, who has to retake a class, retention rates. I didn't look at that stuff. So there might be larger gaps here that are hidden. Uh, similarly, you know, there's a big difference between a C minus and a D or between a D and an F, but I treated all those as numerically equal differences. Those could be huge differences stuff to look at but i tried to get the big picture idea and analyze it in the most conservative way possible because now i think when you consider these discrepancies these achievement gaps hopefully it's it's sinking in that these are major issues also there's lots of other ways to organize and analyze the data i'm sure my colleagues in psychology sociology economics political science are all thinking i can't believe you analyzed it that way i would totally do it this other way I hope you do, you know, we can talk about uh, data sharing. There are some privacy issues, but we can talk about it. And if there's a better way to analyze it, I'm totally open to it. And you will have an opportunity to help me with that. All right, that is the first half. I'm gonna take a deep breath because now I'm gonna dive into the possible causes and solutions in the second half of the talk. This is where things get more speculative because I don't know the causes and I don't know the solutions. I've this isn't my main field of research, uh, looking at achievement gaps and thinking about uh, these causes. This is sort of my new area of research. Uh, I'm trained in cognitive psychology and my research, for those of you who don't know, is really about language, linguistic framing, how language both reflects and shapes uh, how we think and, and, and our attitudes. Um, so it's, it's not quite this, um, but I've been diving into this literature. Um, Don asked an important question. Do I know if similar studies are done in other campuses? Um, and do, I'm curious if these numbers vary in the faculty were, were majority brown or not majority um, uh, white, like they are here. The answer is yes, similar studies are conducted elsewhere. I'm still working through this data. We do know that faculty makeup affects the magnitude of the achievement gap, something I'm going to flag momentarily. So when you have more diverse faculty, when the faculty more reflects the student body, you do see reductions in achievement gaps based on uh, underrepresented minority status. I don't know about the other categories. Uh, this is a very large, complicated literature. Um, and, and for example, how does who teaches, 
whom impact this data. I'm sure it does. I do have who taught each class and I was extremely hesitant to dive into that because I think I have a very limited sample, three years of data. I don't want to I don't want to be calling people out. And I think it's safe to say that we're seeing these gaps for everyone everywhere. And we should all assume that they're happening for all of us right now. Um, but Don, that's a really, really important point that part of the issue is uh, sort of the makeup of our faculty. And I will be flagging that momentarily. So one other thing, one other word of caution now, I'm gonna have a lot of words of caution in the second half of this talk, I'm sorry to say. One is historically, how talk of achievement gaps has been interpreted and understood and used uh, politically. And so I think a great expression of that, if you don't mind the, the long quotation here, comes from Ibram Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. And he has a whole chapter where he dives into so-called achievement gaps. And here's what he says. The idea of an achievement gap means there's a disparity in academic performance between groups of students. Implicit in this idea is that academic achievement as measured by statistical instruments like test scores and dropout rates is the only form of academic achievement. So flagging that, that's why I mentioned, you know, I have a course measure of academic achievement. Don't kid yourself, that's not the only way to think about achievement. And it might not be the best in some respects, although I do think it's an important one. But he goes on to the heart of the matter, I think. There's an even more sinister implication in achievement gap talk that disparities in academic achievement accurately reflect disparities in intelligence among racial groups. Intellect is the linchpin of behavior and the racist idea of the achievement gap is the linchpin of behavioral racism. And he's right, you know, there's huge legacies of racist discussions of and use of concepts like intelligence, test scores, SAT scores, as if they reflect true essential underlying differences between groups, primarily uh, this has been between underrepresented minority groups, uh, black and brown groups specifically, uh, and, and you know, white and Asian groups. And um, you know, I, I've been grappling this with this you know, as a scholar in the field of psychology because the whole concept of intelligence as a measurable trait is rooted in kind of eugenics ideas, racist ideas, phren phrenology, and I think it's important that we flag this because this is how a lot of this conversation reads when it's brought to the, to the, to the, um, to the popular uh, consciousness. So we need to be careful in that. And I wanna specifically highlight, I do not consider any of these achievement gaps to reflect underlying, um, uh, these, uh, underlying essentialized differences in intelligence. I think that's a, a weak and, and, and uh, uh, cowardly way to, to think about this. That makes you not wanna do the hard work. Atar uh, does an, an interesting point that you don't hear the claims are, are that males are less intelligent than, than, than women given the gender gap, right? The, the stereotype is in the opposite direction, yet our achievement gap is, 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 and everyone's that I've seen, is that women do better than men on average everywhere. And yes, yet, right, so these are, these are good points. Now, Kendi goes on and makes another great point in this chapter that I wanna highlight to frame my discussion of the causes and solutions. He says, what if we realize the best way to ensure an effective educational system is not by standardizing our curricula and tests, but by standardizing opportunities available to all students. In other words, the racial problem, but I would add all of our achievement gaps, is an opportunity gap, as anti-racist reformers call it, not an achievement gap. So from here on out, I, I want us to think about this. We cannot change the opportunities our students had uh, at least not without collective societal actions when they come into our campus. But what we can do, what we have the power to do, and what I wanna really push us all towards, and this builds on what Jerima was talking about, and it builds on stuff Barry has been talking about and what Millie was talking about, is give an equal opportunity for all of our students for success. And I hope it's clear, they do not have that equal opportunity right now. They don't. We're, we, we have not given them this equal opportunity. And I should say, it's not our fault in some ways, uh, but now that we're starting to look at this and measure this, I, I want us to, to try to be all together and how do we equate these opportunities? All right, so where are these opportunities failing? I, I built a little matrix to try to simplify an extremely complex literature that I have only started to dig into uh, across various fields. And so here's how I want to break down. What are the causal factors? So in what areas 
our students is something happening where by being member of one of these disadvantaged groups, your opportunity for success is limited. So there are, level, there are factors at the level of the student themselves, but there's also factors at the level of us, the faculty, who are teaching the students and assigning grades and putting them in an academic environment. Similarly, there are factors that affect the student as an individual, their individual psychology or their individual um, social and financial uh, standing. And then there are the systemic issues that face the students and the systemic issues that face the faculty. And that includes institutional and systemic factors at purchase, as well as in the larger society, some of which we might be able to do something about, some of which we can't. Now, all of these factors are themselves interactive and interrelated as I'm gonna to hope to make clear. And some of the causal arrows, arrows are stronger than others, but there, this is like a mutual web of causation. This is an extremely complex, I don't know the, the best metaphor, causal manifold, manifold. Um, but this is, this is huge. Um, I see one comment, the lack of culturally relevant teaching has been the main factor in producing disparities. I think it's a key factor. I'm actually skeptical that it's the main factor. It's a main factor. I think there's multiple main factors, but I wanna, I'm gonna pull that one out, culturally relevant teaching specifically in a moment. So what are these factors? At the individual level, uh, Lee says, can you explain more what it means to address an opportunity gap versus achievement gap? Okay, what I, here's what I mean. What we need to do to solve this achievement gap, the thing we're measuring in grades, is changing students' opportunities to actually be in a successful place to succeed and on campus. So that's why I'm focused on the opportunity side now. I don't forget about their grades. That's gonna follow the, these other changes. That's all I mean. And you'll see wh what I mean more now. Okay, so at the individual student level, um, there are factors like the mental health of our students. So for example, our underrepresented minority students, and I hear this from them directly, and especially with everything that's gone on, I've been in contact with several of my um, alumni seniors who graduated working with me who have talked about the incredible mental health toll uh, that, that the events over the past few months have, have taken. N not that these were new events, but just the onslaught on top of the already effects of the pandemic and everything. I think that's clear from what we're seeing in Wisconsin this week. This doesn't seem to be going away. And uh, this is huge, the mental health of our students. Then there's the sort of psychological health independent of the mental health, although these interact, uh, which I'm classifying here as feelings of belonging, but it could also be the converse feelings of exclusion, feelings of threat. It's the psychological state that our students are in when they're on campus and when they're in the classroom. And then there's the individual social and financial support that our students are receiving. You know, if you're a student that has uh, wealthier parents and you don't need to work two jobs, that's going to affect you as an individual and affect your opportunity for success on campus. So those are individual student factors. At the systemic level, what I mean is things like, what is the overall campus climate? What is the institutional support and the institutional values that students are exposed to? The broader cultural attitudes, as well as systemic biases in our culture and in our institution. Now, what's great, and I'm, I'm going to point this out multiple times, is we are seeing, I'm hopeful, real movement, and Jarima's whole presentation was about this, real movement for, towards addressing some of these systemic um, issues. So for example, I think the symbolic stopping of the clock and, and this call to action is a way to communicate our institutional values that I know that many of our students felt weren't there and weren't being communicated. So, so we are starting to address some of these. My argument's gonna be we need to be addressing all of them and thinking about that. All right, at the faculty level, we have another thing that um, Jarima mentioned is, is sort of bias and prejudice. So if you are a professor who is biased against a group of students, that could be affecting how you treat them, which could affect their feelings of belonging, which could affect their grades. Again, this mutual causation. I think our teaching, so we've already seen um, uh, culturally relevant teaching as, a, as an issue. And this is something that I'm going to talk about more. I talk about in my workshops, my consultations, and Leandro is leading a discussion of, of, of a relevant, culturally relevant um, use of materials and, and activities in the class as well. Then there's stuff that we don't talk about, but now in the pandemic, I'd want us to, which is our own mental health and our own kind of personal support and, and financial support that we have as individuals. This takes a toll on us as faculty. I know that uh, we've had to work a lot more over the summer and we're excited and happy, but it does take a toll. And when our mental health 
right? And our support is lagging. I think that's going to end up disadvantaging some of the 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 the, the already vulnerable groups more, uh, uh, based on some of their own individual factors. And then we have system systemic uh, issues related to faculty. So this is the uh, Don raised the diversity of the faculty, and I was happy. I'm happy to hear that this is something that we're actively tackling, and SUNY is trying to look into. But we should make sure to keep on that as well as our own institutional support and the institutional values and the cultural values, the same things that affect our students affect us as faculty. Those are those systemic issues. So this is how I wanna break it down. There is research showing that each of these is related in some way to achievement gaps and that addressing each of these can somewhat close the gaps. Although I am personally skeptical that focusing just on one or another is gonna have an impact. It seems like in Jarima's presentation, she's hinting at the same thing, that we need to focus on a lot of these things together, and that's great. Now, I will say, diving into the psychology literature, psychologists have largely been looking at that, that individual student, like feelings of belonging and, and mental health elements, not surprisingly, because this is what psychologists study. So the next slide has a lot of info. I'm not gonna talk about it. I just wanna point out that what psychologists and education researchers have tried to do is develop little small interventions small things that a school or that a faculty member can do to try to uh, make students feel like more belonging or improve health outcomes, mental health outcomes, to reduce these gaps. There's a bunch of these interventions. They all have been subjected to different um, randomized control trials, uh, and they've all been shown to work. I'll be honest, only some of these have been done multiple times, as you've seen. So only some of these have been replicated. Um, only some of them have been replicated across different kinds of colleges. SUNY Purchase is very different from University of Michigan or from Princeton, and we don't know how these transfer. I will say I want to um, give a, sh uh, a, um, a shout out to Patty Bice and the Student Success Committee uh, who have looked into these kinds of interventions and sought to implement some of them with some of our students. I don't know if we have data on whether it worked. I think Given the pandemic, it might be hard to see for a few years. But these are the kinds of things, and I can talk about these in the Q&A, I don't want to go into them now, that I want to be looking more at and doing more research on, and how could these be incorporated into our curriculum, into our pedagogy uh, as a standardized fair. So um, a few more things. Um, what can you as a faculty member do right now? Like classes start next week. Like what can you do? I think there's a few things you can do. And the key goes back to a piece of the data. And some people have already brought this up in the, in the chat, which is make your larger class feel like a smaller one. So I'll, I'll point out again, our tiny classes where it's just a professor and one to five students, we do not have achievement gaps at all. And that's not because that's different students in that class than in the large lectures. It's because the whole social environment of that small class uh, it enables students to have, have a chance to, to basically perform as well as they can. But there's ways that you can make your larger class feel like a smaller one. Now, I didn't create these. And in fact, I haven't done my own uh, research on this, but members of our community have. So not to embarrass Linda Bastone, but she's actually published multiple articles with titles like pedagogical choices make large classes feel small. So if you go on Google Scholar, you can um, you can find uh, some of her data. She, she wrote these articles and has done this research with Karen Singer Freeman, who, who um, has moved on to other opportunities in her own career, looking at very similar things, but had been in the psychology department until recently. And they've done a lot of this research. They've also done, gotten these grants to implement programs that are basically specifically designed to target some of these achievement gaps with great success, which is something I'll come back to. Oh, and Ryan is pointing out that Patty has data with positive outcomes from Summer Success Fellows Program. Excellent. So some of the stuff that we're already doing in small scales at purchase has an impact. And those are things that I want to, I'll say in a minute, we should, we should improve. So you can look at uh, Linda's papers for more details, but I'll flag a few things. And anyone who has done one of my teaching workshops, these are all going to be review. This is nothing new. I could call on one of you for, uh, to, to promote this. But the key and what we should all think about how we want to do this next week Build a welcoming, positive social environment in the classroom. Every student should feel like they belong. Every student should feel like that they're, uh, whoever they are, they, they can contribute. And this is gonna be tougher than ever in the pandemic because our students have differential access to resources. 
I would recommend reaching out to students, making sure they have access to technology, making sure that if they don't, um, that you can accommodate them in some way. There's a way to make things asynchronously available. Whatever you can do to make sure that students feel like they belong, talk about how um, diversity uh, of opinions and attitudes and individual identities in the class is what makes the class successful, is good. Um, you know, this is, you know, back to the point about having diverse faculty matters. One of the reasons it matters is because if you have a professor that looks like you and has had similar life experiences as you, you feel like you belong more. As opposed to if you are, um, you know, uh, a student and you have a professor that looks like me, uh, who, who they might not identify with, and vice versa. So there's challenges for all of us as faculty based on who we are and our identity that we need to think about how to accommodate a positive social environment for everyone. Um, another thing I think is a general good practice, and again, Linda talks about this in her research papers, is the use of lots of low stakes assessments rather than let's say one big midterm and one big final. If you have something that's worth a lot, it can lead to additional feelings of anxiety, sometimes things called stereotype threat in the psychology literature, the, the fear that you're gonna confirm a stereotype against your group can kind of counterproductively undermine your performance. Um, and so if you break up your assignments, there's more of them and they're low stakes, no single one matters as much for final grades, then doing poorly on one is not as much uh, a set, of a setback, it doesn't impact your final grade as much, and that can greatly improve the motivation to, to um, respond productively to those challenges. And you can intervene as a professor multiple times to, to encourage that. Transparency matters a lot. Um, in it, you know, it's gonna be hard to form an emotional connections with students. I was talking about this with some of the new faculty yesterday, but transparency helps. Be honest about um, how to succeed in the class, why your class is structured the way it is, uh, why, you're, why you're using certain assignments, why they matter, how they impact students, you know, their major or the fact that they're in a gen ed, why is the gen ed covering this material, why is it important, why is it great that students are there, what are they going to learn, why is it good that they're going to learn it, transparency. This is going to let students know, okay, now I understand why I am in this class. That again is going to engage students and, and motivate those feelings of belonging. And finally, making the course personally relevant. So students should feel like, not only do they have transparent knowledge about how to succeed, so giving students a sense that, okay, I can control my destiny in this class, I actually belong and I know what to do to succeed, but it matters to me. So this, uh, depending on your class, you know, think about who your students are, but think about making your, your course materials um, relevant to students and relevant to their goals. So it should be goal oriented. Some of our students don't, don't know what their goals are, so exploring that with them is part of this process, but one thing I do recommend, and this I got from Linda's paper, is encouraging self-relevant writing. So writing in the class that's about how the material in the class is relevant to them and what are their own values and, and goals and, and how does this material relate to them and help them achieve that. Having little opportunities for that kind of thing, and even on the first day as just like a, a welcoming activity could be something good. This is all I'm gonna say about this for now. This is where my pedagogy training and inner, and inner um, interactivity is going to come in later in the semester and hopefully more moving forward with workshops. Uh, but but this, is, this is where I'm starting. And, and this, these kinds of things form part of the core of culturally um, sensitive teaching practices that have been mentioned in the comments that Leandro et al. are going to build on in the next section. Okay, now I want to give everyone a warning. And that is, um, we all have good intentions. And we all have intuitions about what is going to work, what should work, what we should do. And of course, easy solutions are good because, you know, it's not going to, we don't have to change our whole curriculum or our whole school or everything about our lives to implement them. But uh, these kinds of easy, simple changes may work and they may not. And sometimes they can backfire and make things worse, go counter to our intentions, uh, or sometimes they just cost a lot of time and money without addressing the core or the systemic issues. And so I want to flag that right here, and I'm gonna give a couple examples. Uh, and Davaloy has a, a comment. Um, yeah, there's a, there, there is a racist history in the academy, and um, uh, we need to disrupt some of this stuff. That's why I mentioned that thinking about achievement gap 
you know, just looking at the grades and how we're doing things is, is a course measure and we need to think about other ways of doing that, absolutely. All right, so let me give a couple examples of solutions that I think were created with good intention, intention seemed like they should work, but might not. The first is trigger warnings. Some of you have used these, some of you are using them this semester. A trigger warning is a notice on, on a reading, on a class, on a film that says, please be warned, this is a trigger warning. This film contains depictions of violence or sexual assault, something that might trigger um, uh, a reaction in students, especially students who have experienced trauma in that domain. So there's a, this is, I, intuitively, this is based on the idea that people who have uh, experienced trauma, um, confronting that trauma is difficult. It can be extremely negative. They can have, if they have, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, they can be triggered by a stimulus that reactivates old emotions, exacerbates their mental health condition, makes it worse. So a trigger warning seems like an intuitive idea and, and faculty have been using them for years. Some universities and colleges mandate them. You have to use them. And many students want them to be mandated. All right, seems great, what's the harm? Well, it turns out when you start conducting research on trigger warnings, you see headlines like this popping up in the, in the media. So is this a death knell for trigger warnings? Did trigger warnings actually work? And more, recent learning, uh, more recently, uh, trigger warnings may do more harm than good. So when researchers have studied this stuff, they tested, does putting a trigger warning on a passage, on a film, and then having students watch it actually reduce the, the mental health you know, problems? Does it help our students? A lot of the early studies were basically finding no. And then critics said, well, you should really be studying the students who have experienced trauma. And just a couple of months ago in the premier clinical psychology journal in the world, Clinical Psychological Science, or one of the premier ones, they did an enormous uh, randomized control trial. Uh, this was probably the best, um, this was modeled after medical, you know, uh, 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 like drug treatment trials, and they included a variety of participants, some of whom actually had trauma. So here's just a quote from their conclusions. We found no evidence that trigger warnings were helpful for trauma survivors, for participants who self-reported a post-traumatic stress disorder, or for participants who qualified for probable PTSD, even when survivors' trauma matched the content of the passage they read. Okay, so it didn't help them. Here's the more troubling part to me. We found substantial evidence that trigger warnings counter therapeutically reinforce survivors' view of their trauma as central to their identity. This is a technical bit of clinical psych. What this means is, if to the extent that you view what happened to you, the trauma as central, as part of who you are, your mental health outcomes are worse. It's harder to reduce the symptoms. It's harder to actually successfully go through treatment. Part of treatment and therapy is getting you to not identify your trauma as central to your identity. And yet, they found some evidence that trigger warnings reinforce the idea that uh, the trauma is central to identity. So this is, is, is a backlash. So I wouldn't use trigger warnings. Now, I use blanket kind of content warnings in my classes like, hey, we might be talking about, you know, this is a psychology class. We're gonna talk about PTSD in this class. I teach a class on learning and memory. So we're gonna talk about traumatic things. General one, go through it, but I don't use a specific trigger warning. This you know, clip or this reading is gonna contain discussion of X, Y, and Z. And it's because of this research. So what I wanna flag here is I think it's critical that we actually look to the research, that we actually measure things and track how they're affecting certain outcomes over time. Even if we can't measure things perfectly, I think that we don't want to get into a case, a situation where we're using different techniques to try to solve a problem and actually making it worse potentially. And the only way we're going to know that is if we do the right research. There's another um, area of, um, okay, Shaka's mentioning many black students check out for many depictions of anti-blackness or in some cases discussions of them. Totally agree. I'm not saying that there aren't, um, there aren't issues that, that shouldn't be talked about or that shouldn't be mentioned. It's the specific use of a trigger warning with that kind of language that I think is, is potentially harmful. Um, so I think what I am encouraging is more transparent discussion of all of these issues. So Shaka, I think 
you know, and I, and I know you personally, I know you do this, which is like questioning everything and talking about everything and all the, the potential things lurking in, in these, uh, in whatever the materials we're using. So that I think is critical. It's this specific kind of trigger warning that I think is uh, potentially problematic. So another uh, area where we try to, um, where we try to help is in talking about implicit bias. So Jarima talked about how, you know, and I think she's spot on, implicit biases can shape our behaviors. I put that in my causal matrix. I think like Jarima said, we all have implicit biases and they shape how, how we treat each other and they, and they might shape, you know, how, how uh, students feel on campus and, and all this stuff. And so it's something we should talk about. That said, if you look at the research on implicit bias training, I don't think there's um, evidence that they are going to solve our problems on their own. And I was really happy that Jarima pointed out that the training we're doing now is not a one and done, like many institutions and lots of corporations do. Like Starbucks had one day of training, boom, they're done, and now it's over. And of course, you hear a few months later, they're not allowing their employees to wear uh, Black Lives Matter masks while they work. Obviously, the training didn't work for the corporate headquarters. Um, but there is research on does implicit bias training work? And the evidence is that it, it, it doesn't. Um, when you can measure people's implicit bias, but it's really fickle, the instruments that you use to measure this bias are not reliable. So for example, imagine you got on a scale one morning and it said you weighed 150 pounds and you got on the scale the next morning and it said you weighed 250 pounds. It's an unreliable measure of your weight. These measures of implicit bias are similarly unreliable. Uh, I'll note the training we did doesn't measure them. It's, it's an exploration of them. So it's something a little different. And then you can do these trainings where you try to change people's implicit biases and you can change them. And it turns out it doesn't change anything about their behavior. Uh, one telling interview happened recently in June uh, with PBS and Anthony Greenwald, who's a very famous social psychologist. In fact, he's one of the creators of the implicit association test that measures implicit bias, one of the measures. And he uh, has been long been an advocate for trying to deal with implicit bias. But now in 2020, here's what he says. I'm at the moment very skeptical about most of what's offered under the label implicit bias training because the methods being used have not been tested scientifically to indicate they're effective. And they're using it without trying to assess whether the training they do is achieving the desired results. After 10 years of doing this stuff and nobody reporting data, I think the logical conclusion is that if it was working, we would have heard. This might seem very strange and controversial, but I think the, the evidence is that these things on their own don't have much of an impact. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do them, although there's some evidence that some kinds of trainings, I'm gonna flag not the one that, we, that we're doing, but some of these trainings can backfire because they make people um, more likely to use stereotypes to judge others, which is exactly what we wanna get away from. Um, but uh, I, I think if we're looking at these sort of easy, simple solutions, all I want to flag is that I'm very skeptical of them and that there are a lot of nuances. And I think we need to be thinking bigger and thinking in terms of long-term assessment so that we figure out is what we're doing actually working to address the problems at a deeper level. So that, that is my, my level of nuance here. And I think uh, Rachel is pointing out in the discussion, there are nuances in how warnings can be used. There are variables between using them or not, absolutely. Um, however, the assumption that just using them is going to be effective and not counterproductive is something that I think we need to think carefully about. I really want us to think that the data, while it can be flawed, it does matter. And if we're spending all of our time and effort doing certain things and not others, we may be missing the boat. So that's, that's the conversation I wanna start. I realize that that might rub some people the wrong way, and it might seem controversial and it might be upsetting, but that to move forward and actually solve the big problems, I think that's what we have to do. And I wanna highlight that I think that's where this conversation is now. That's what, that's what I was taking out of Jarima's nine point plan, which is thinking big and addressing all of these areas instead of trying to pinpoint just one. All right, I'm realizing I'm running out of time. So I just have a couple more slides that, that I wanna to, to wrap up the discussion, the key takeaways. How can we move towards effective solutions now that I've sort of dissed some of these uh, smaller scale efforts? One is something that I am seeing already, which is buy-in and commitment at all levels of the college. I think we're there. 
I think we're getting there right now and that's really exciting. Two is evidence-based initiatives with objective outcomes measured and tracked longitudinally. I think again, we're seeing some efforts to do this. So uh, the Student Success Committee has been implementing programs. Uh, there's gonna be a climate uh, assessment on campus. I'm looking at these achievement gaps. I'm putting objective in quotes because there's flaws with each of these. But if we can look at actual outcomes for our students, lots of different possible outcomes, measure them and track them over time, we can get a sense, is what we're doing working? Which things are working? How do they work better? How can we improve it? And that I think is the only way to, to address these academic issues that I'm talking about. I think another thing we're seeing is uh, to leverage the expertise and engagement of the whole community. And you know, I've been at Purchase for eight years and I've been hearing a lot of this and I am seeing more of this now than ever. I think you're, we were seeing so much involvement from faculty and staff and librarians and everyone and administration over the summer in confronting the pandemic, in implementing a whole workshop training system for remote teaching, and now more than ever for addressing some of these issues related to, to diversity and inclusion issues. Um, and it's really exciting to me because I think that we have an incredible uh, body of talent and uh, a variable body of talent. So I know some things, I'm trying to showcase what I've been able to work on. And I think you're already seeing in the comments people whose expertise is so much bigger and better than mine in so many of these key areas, speaking up and wanting to get involved. And I know that a lot of different departments and areas are talking about this. I know the administration is talking about this. I know our new president has already talked about this. So I wanna keep this going. How can, how can we leverage our own expertise to try to build our community forward? And finally, highlight something that, again, Jareem already highlighted, more resources for stuff we know works. So we have programs on campus that Student Success Summer Program, the EOP and MAP programs, which provide resources for you know, first generation students, um, uh, diversity initiatives for hiring faculty and librarians, and I would also add mental health counselors. Um, all these things we know works from, from the literature already. And I know, you know talking about spending money right now is tough since we uh, are in a very difficult economic situation, but thinking long-term, if we can keep in keeping these, uh, you know, increase these resources. I love uh, the talk about fundraising that, that Millie and Jarima highlighted, grants, anything that we can do. And I just wanna urge all of us to get involved in whatever way you can. So here's the next steps. One thing I wanna do is, uh, and that I talked to Barry about is more pedagogy training. So additional workshops that I can deliver on things like how to make your large lecture class feel like a small seminar. I want more of that. I also do more, pedagogy consulting. And I think we've seen in the comments, there's lots of people who have thought very deeply about this that, um, uh, can, uh, that, that, I, that I think can also contribute to this sort of pedagogy. Uh, so if you're interested in getting involved with that, please talk to me and I, I, can, I can help be the liaison for creating new programs with that. I, I wanna do that. Number two, I'd like to put together a task force that's specifically focused on these academic achievement issues. So this would be largely faculty, but I'd also love staff members, uh, especially members of the Student Success Committee, people who are working on stuff that intersects with this, um, uh, that, that care about this stuff. But that would really be you know, doing a deep dive into the sort of um, the, the academic side of this. So a, a really an academic um, task force to examine these, these issues on campus. I have already, since I've previewed some of this with some of my colleagues, I've already gotten interest from several people. If you are interested in this, if you wanna do this, um, I would like you to tell me. And this is something that we can put together. It doesn't even have to be official. This can be our unofficial research group. Although, you know, uh, whatever, I, I, I wanna do this and, and think about ways that we can do more research about what's worked, what other schools have done, which is something that's been raised in the comments and so on. Uh, so focused on these academic issues that I would see complementing uh, uh, Jarima's work and the work of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, which are not exclusively about academics, as well as the Student Success Committee, which is a broader kind of institutional um, reform. Leandro is being extremely kind, and, and since I am way too long-winded, which I'm really sorry for, I swear to God when I practiced this, it was like half an hour shorter, I'm sorry, um, that, um, that we, we delay the next one so you, you all have some opportunities to ask questions. This next point is my last point, and then we can move to questions which is this collective action. Again, I, um, 
Uh, oh yeah, Yanine is mentioning task force, great idea. We could take advantage of the new online student evaluation system to get more data. Yes, data, data, data. So I, uh, I, I like data. So the other thing I wanna promote, which again, people are already doing, and, and I'm late to this game, uh, as others have mentioned, which is getting everyone involved. The conversation is key, but also in doing the work, and I'm seeing this, I've, I've, I've heard that some departments and areas already have their own task force for thinking about this. Um, I know that as chair in psychology, uh, you know, this is gonna be an agenda item on our faculty meetings. How can we diversify our curriculum? How can we think about how our curriculum is structured uh, in a way to provide equal opportunities? Can we implement peer mentoring programs? This is something that Linda and Karen's grant was all about. This is something that EOP provides the students. These are things we know work. How, how can we, you know, on, with the limited resources or no resources we have, think about how to implement um, kind of mentoring programs? Is it something with more learning assistant opportunities? Is it something with trying to find uh, grant funding for our students? You know, what is it? I don't know. It's going to depend on your area, but this is my, my contribution to Jarima's call to action is that there's a lot that we can do as faculty um, uh, to, to, to build on this discussion and work together. And, and I'll just end there. Um, all I wanna say is that this pandemic has been really hard on me personally. I have lost family members. Um, I have had a difficult situation and yet, oh, I've been asked to show the other one, okay. And um, I know that our students, many of them have been impacted way more than I have. I know this because I've heard from some of them. And so this is like the hardest, I mean, this is really a hard time. Um, and yet I also think, and this is echoing what Millie and, and Jarima said, this is an opportunity. This is an opportunity for us all to reflect, mostly from the comfort of, of our home offices, I guess, our, our kitchen tables wherever we are, is an opportunity to reflect and think about how we can use this disruption to the system to actually recreate some of our curriculum to make, uh, to make things you know, more equal opportunity for everyone. And, and that is what I wanna do. I want us all to do that. And so that, that is all. Um, thank you, especially to Barry, who helped make this, um, uh, this research as part of my sabbatical happen to Barb and, and Bob for helping me with the data collection, to Linda and Karen for, uh, they modeled this project. They actually did something similar, this achievement gap, looking at our STEM courses in the natural sciences, science, technology, um, engineering, math, computer science. And, and I also wanna thank to uh, my psych department colleagues. So thank you so much to everyone. So Stephen, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I know we're short on time, but I, I just wanna, uh, before we end, uh, I want to echo something that I think uh, Stevens hit on a number of times, but I, I believe that what we do next will be critically important uh, for a number of reasons. How we do it, how we make that decision about what to do next uh, will be critically important because of, there's so much noise out there that pushes against some of our very core values as an, as, as an institution, which is to be thoughtful, to be well-informed, and, and to build consensus. I think coming out of this pandemic, uh, there'll be a lot of different uh, competing ideas about education. I think to remain steadfast to our institution, to our students, will require strength, fortitude, informed by this type of thinking and research about our students and about the values we hold true from the fundamental way we value what we grade or as much as how we grade it, uh, which I think Stephen has made very clear. So the next things we do about these type of issues will be critically important because it will have to address so much of the uh, wrong that's been pointed out about the pandemic uh, uh, because of the pandemic. So Steve, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, it's, it's, it's evolved since even since I saw the results early in the spring. And um, I just wanna uh, hope that we uh, will we'll continue this uh, as, as soon as we can, so.
I look forward to seeing you at the next session, which starts at 1215. Yes, so we have a few minutes for questions and then this is something I'm also happy to, you know, I have flexibility in my schedule with no commute. So I'm also happy to talk to people one-on-one -on -one or to talk to a department. So if you raise your hand, yes, um, Paul Siegel, see your hand is up. Hey, Steve, thank you not only for a wonderful presentation, but an equally lovely and sophisticated study. Um, and I have to say quickly, I personally have no problem with how you analyze the data. Um, if I know you said you had GPA and SAT scores only for 42 percent. If whatever effect you that, however minimal it was in the 42 percent, did you look at if, if that was extrapolated? You know, like if it was extrapolated and, and, and there was a similar influence on like, all, you know, all of the students, would that have changed the results? Um, if I understand your question correctly, the answer is no. Because, and, and the reason is, so that was like my most conservative test, which was throwing both high school GPA and SATs. So some students we don't have SAT scores for, some students we have ACT instead. Um, for more students, we have GPA than either of those alone. And whenever I looked at any of them, it didn't, it didn't change the results. So I, I do think that um, that was the, the best, most conservative test case I could do. Um, uh, but again, there's, there's, there's problems with all this analysis. And I know that, you know, Don raised the important point that we're not capturing something about the other opportunities that students had in high school, the, the, their, where they went to high school, what their high school was like. So, um, and if you, oh, I see, yeah, if you combine them, you, you see the same thing. In, in other words, we see the gaps even at the high end of the, the performance in high school scales, right? The students who got 4.0s and 1500s on the, the SATs, there are still gaps. Uh, that's not that many students, but there's still gaps. Um, and uh, Lawrence is asking, is there a self-selection issue with those who did or didn't take the SATs? Yes, um, uh, that is quite possible. But again, the SATs itself is a flawed measure and many things might contribute to variable performance on that way over and above, you know, prepare, academic preparedness as whatever that even means. So I'm trying my best with the limits of the data um, and there's certainly other things that we could consider. Um, Janice, yeah, experience should be centered in this conversation. I agree. I think the individual experiences of uh, the identities of faculty and students is, is a major part of this. Any other questions? It's hard for me to see everyone. So if you just want to, yeah, Robin, I see you. Hi, Stephen. Thank you so much for this important work and the data that supports it. Um, I guess I would love us to move to a place where we kind of, as faculty at large, kind of agree and because uh, you know, there is a lot of discussion around the data gathering and you know and I, I'm I just would love to move towards agreement and action points um, that might be really easily uh, embraced and followed by faculty that are interested and that buy buy the premise and or accept the premise and want to move towards correcting or um, addressing um, and uh, I would, I would, I just want to encourage us as a faculty to be more, be generous about that and to maybe support and move forward. Cause it's, this is, I, this is urgent. And as a faculty woman, disabled woman of color, uh, I am completely on board with this and ready to have an, our institution take advantage of this place where we are as a, as a united front. Um, so uh, could we do that, please? <laughs> Thank you, Robin. I, I really appreciate that point. I think that's a great point. So that's where, that's how I envision the work of the task force. I'd like to get a group of people together. Everyone's invited. Since we're doing this on Zoom, we can have it be big. Um, we'll, we'll have discussions about this. This is my goal. And m my idea, you know, my vision is that what, do it, we'll do some research and we'll try to come up with like an action plan that here's what we, here's our recommendations that each department figure out how it can do these X number of things in their curriculum, right? To the best of your ability, you know, it's going to be very discipline specific. There's, there's some things you can do in, in 
uh, sociology that you might not be able to do in uh, computer science, but, but sort of a, a, a general set of guidelines, you know, academic or pedagogical guidelines that we will send out to everyone that ideally that departments will talk about how they're gonna to try to implement them. And then what we can try to do is, you know, a year from now, two, three, each year, I, I'm hoping that I can get this data again. And now that I you know, know how to, to work with the data, it's, it's much easier for me to, to re-implement these kinds of analyses and we can track it over time and we can try to get more um, data. Um, so uh, yes, Raman, I wanna come up with an action plan and then I want people to think about how they can try to implement it to the best of their ability. And I think that would be great. Um, looking at some of the questions in the, the comments, did I study dance specific data? I looked at dance, I looked at everything at one point. I can't recall uh, exactly, you know, how the dance data were similar or different to anything else. I, I'm happy to do that. If, some, if anyone wants me to look at the data for their area, independently, please email me. Just note that because it's only three years worth of data, you know, when you look at it all together, it's a lot of data, but if you start digging in, digging in, digging in, it might, you, the, there's a lot more variability in there. But yes, I'm happy to do that. Um, uh, Shaka it doesn't want to be cynical, even though he's making a cynical point, which is fair, which is some of this has been done or at least requested across the college. Totally agree. I'm restarting the conversation. Sometimes you have to use, uh, sometimes we have to use the moment to, to change how things are implemented. So I don't know if I can be effective in doing that, but that's what I want us to do. So I'm not saying this hasn't been tried. I'm not saying stuff hasn't been tried before by us, by others. I'm not saying that people aren't gonna just be like, forget it, this sounds too hard. So um, uh, I, yeah, this is something that, uh, uh, I'm hopeful though. I'm gonna try to use the the momentum that we have now to try to, to try to get this on here. Um, I see, you know, comments splitting your classes into small discussion groups. I love that. Please keep doing that. Um, Matthew asks about the literature, the achievement gaps in terms of gender. Okay, so this is a this is an interesting one, and some that people are surprised, especially since if you look at Linda's past work, she's looked at the opposite, which is achievement gaps, you know, where women are disadvantaged compared to men in science classes, for example. Although if you look at the natural sciences of the, as a whole, we see the, the female advantage. But this clearly isn't about being disadvantaged in society as a whole, right? Because there you'd expect the opposite. So what's going on there? There is a complex literature on this. Um, you, there are, uh, Trends, so the, the, the gender achievement gap in terms of the female advantage started emerging in the 1980s as more and more women were getting into uh, higher education and, and really started broadening in the 1990s up through today and now exists in even in graduate programs where it didn't exist 10, 20 years ago, medical schools, law schools, uh, many PhD programs, although in others like computer science, physics, and philosophy, you see the opposite patterns. But on the whole, women have an advantage at that level, although now if you jump up to the um, associate or full professor level, you see the exact opposite, a male advantage in academia. But what is going on? One is that reading scores for boys has been dropping and is atrocious across the board. I don't know the cause of that. I would hesitate. Some people point to those intrinsic differences. I think since these gender things are so fluid and have changed so many times over the course of history, that's unlikely. I think there are broader perhaps societal trends and cultural attitudes towards uh, uh, boys in education that makes boys more likely to devalue education now relative to, to women in some respects. Um, and uh, other than that, I, I don't know exactly what the causes are specifically at purchase. And that is something that I'd like to look into. Um, okay, Shaka says 2013 and 2016 were moments too, no shade. I know, I know. Um, but I'm talking about this moment and I can't control how things went in the past. And eventually, you know, sometimes it takes a few rattles of the, of the you know, system to crack it. So maybe we're there. Um, Lee is suggesting breakout discussions. I agree. Um, I don't, I think we don't maybe have time now. Maybe if, there, if there's a lot of interest in that, you know, keeping the conversation going is key and maybe we can have another day to talk about this. Um, this semester or, or think about this and that would be great. Um, 
uh, let's see, smaller class size on an institutional level. <laughs> I didn't raise that because my assumption was given economically where we are, that's unlikely. Yes, the best solution, if all of our classes were five students, I think we could eliminate the achievement gap in one year. That's not gonna happen. It's, it doesn't work as a, a business model for our college. Looking forward, you know, maybe that's something we can try to have more of or think about, but you know, in terms of the pedagogy, I think we should aim for making those large classes feel small. That can involve our individual choices as instructors and how we structure our course and our curriculum. It could also involve things like institutional support for students, peer mentoring systems, all of that, which can contribute to that as well. Um, uh, uh, Don and Janice are raising, you know, are all faculty here. This needs to be something that all faculty are engaged on. I think that is a great idea. So maybe something that we can do is think about how any task force report or guidelines could go out to all faculty. And then when we're talking about part-time faculty that they are being on board. Now, I'm just gonna speak right now for the part-time faculty that I have worked with in my pedagogy training. They're all in. In fact, in many cases, our adjunct faculty already are caring more about some of these issues than, than, than the rest of us. So I don't think it's gonna be a problem. I think we're gonna see buy-in from so many of our, from basically everyone. I mean, I think a lot of people care about this stuff. And I think the, the adjuncts will be happy. The adjunct faculty I know are incredibly passionate um, uh, teachers who come to my pedagogy training with no compensation, who reach out to me for guidance and I'm always happy to give it and that goes. So you can tell any adjunct faculty or part-time faculty you work with to contact me if they wanna learn about this and be happy to distribute this report um, to everyone. Um, I hope, you know, I'm planning on, I, I, I prepared a preliminary report, which Barry referred to. I'm gonna try to revise it over the next, I hope everyone is okay with this. Based on this discussion and how my presentation unfolded. I'm going to try to edit some of it to include some of this, these issues. That's going to take me a while since I'm still gearing up for starting classes and everything. Um, so if you can hold off like a few weeks, I'll have a, you know, updated report. In the meantime, I will distribute these slides. So I'll send everyone my slides. So you have these at least, and then later will be the report with more detail. And even that is going to be incomplete. Um, any other questions? And um, we're kind of last couple. R Robin, you got one more, and then Linda. I'm pushing back, Stephen. Okay. So I think without all this uh, um, mobilizing and task forcing, I think you could send a list. Having been in a couple workshops with you, I think you could send a list of 10 recommended action points, six recommended action points, whatever, three action points that would, to everybody, maybe okay. Barry even can say, give it an amen, or well, I don't know how we get, a, we can say that this is something that the faculty or the school embraces, um, and, sent and say, these are the things we've agreed upon that if you did right now, you would, imp we, we might uh, have an impact on closing the achievement gap and okay. improve learning outcomes from, for our faculty. And I would just wanna push back and say, you don't need a committee, you don't need a task force. I trust you and your data. Barry, thank you for sponsoring it. Take a, take a risk, take the leap, and give us something to chew on so we can try it. And we can report back to you. We can report our data back to you at the end. Um, and we can see if some of your suggestions are effective. All right, Robin, because I don't have enough admin work already. But yes. <laughs> I will do it. I will do it. And, you know, maybe Send I can. Send it to me. I'll do it. I'll do Should it. I start a newsletter, like the pedagogy newsletter? Actually, that's not the worst idea. So this will go out. How about this? In, my, in the email that's going to go out with, like, information for how to talk to me about pedagogy stuff, I'm going to include my whatever point. Yeah, let's, let's talk about how to yeah. take care of that next step forward. Yes, I'll let. Sorry. <laughs> I'll let no, that no, out. just do it. <laughs> Well, here, it hurts I'm me as a scientist. Very, I get it. You know, I want to be very careful and scientific about this, but I, I do totally get it. I can give some advice and I'm going to mostly get it from Linda who has the next question. Yeah, I, so Robin started it, so I'm going to push back a little um, too and just say, I know we have no money and I know we can't make classes actually smaller, but I think we do have to look at where 
the classes are in fact larger and look across the college and make sure that we're not um, <clears throat> further disadvantaging people by virtue of the fact that some students are in those classes and other students are not. So I just don't wanna lose track of that. We may not be able to do it, but I, I, I think we need to acknowledge that <clears throat> it's not uniform across the college and there are pockets, for example, liberal studies comes to mind. Yes, that, that is a great point, that there are there is variability in the, in the distribution of students and the course sizes and other things like that across the college. Uh, there's a couple more questions. Um, uh, Davaloy. You gotta unmute. Oh, hi, sorry. Um, hi, yes. So I just was wondering about, um, hello everyone, I'm an adjunct faculty and uh, I'm happy to be here, but I'm concerned about my fellow adjunct faculties uh, always kind of being put in a strange position to volunteer their time. So I'm wondering if we can model equity within the uh, full-time, uh, part-time uh, staff or the students um, in a way that can maybe incentivize. Um, I know we have budget issues. So what are some creative ways that we can incentivize adjuncts to participate so that uh, the cultural change happens across the board rather than as um, Yes, thank you for that. That is a, that is a really excellent point. Um, this is getting beyond what I know or can do, but I think that's something we should think about and maybe the administration can start thinking about, you know, how can we um, compensate or, uh, or help our adjunct faculty without just saying, you have to do all this extra work for no money uh, since we're already, um, you know, uh, not exactly uh, paying our adjunct faculty as much as we all wish we could. Um, that is something to think about. I'm happy to brainstorm and I don't know what is available. Maybe this is something where fundraising or grants might be available uh, to, to apply for. And maybe that's something that, that we as an institution can look into because I, I do think that's critical. Thank you for that. Um, uh, Chuck Gomez had a question, hand up. Give a second here. If not, um, all right. Anyone else have any questions? At this point, you just got, it's hard for me to like see everyone. So just unmute and like shout it out. I'll put on speaker view. Or no questions. All right. Okay. Well, we're basically at 12.15. So I'm going to end it right there. I want to thank you all for coming. It's been an honor to share this work with you. Um, this was, a, I put a lot of, you know, hard work into this as did other people over the last year and I really care about it and I'm, I'm hoping I communicate it as well. Um, yes, I made the recording and I'll try to figure out how to share that. Um, I'll work on all the technical stuff uh, later. Um, you know, I, we can all be cynical, Shaka, and say, but you're right, like, you know, we've had moments before, what makes this different? we make it different we're the only thing you know we're the ones who can make it different and so hopefully you know if more and more people are, get inspired um and want to work on this stuff and think about our our curriculum and think about our how we want to you know engage with these issues i'm really hoping we can do it and also to everyone please challenge me if you are afraid to speak up uh, or whatever contact me contact me anonymously like i am not uh defensive of this work. I tried my best here. And if there's things I'm missing, I want to be educated about them. I mean, that's one of the reasons I'm also participating in that next section. I want to learn more. I am committed to trying to address some of these stuff because I don't want to be a professor, you know, for the rest of my career where these things are happening in my classes um, and I'm not doing anything about it. So thank you very much, everyone. I'm going to end this Zoom, and I think uh, Leandro maybe is going to start the next one sh presently. And so uh, hopefully he'll give me time to go get a drink of water before we start. But thank you, everyone.